if I can put the spoiler out there before we even really get going, what's important is whether or not, for the first time since Paul Volcker left office in August of 1987, whether or not the Fed is going to defy market pricing. Because that is the implication if they're going to keep hiking interest rates. The important part about this, we can talk more about it, is as long as they continue, even with baby steps, 25 basis points at a time, as long as that continues, quantitative tightening rolls on in the background. And, and that's what they talk about the least is what's absolutely the most important. And that is QT. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Danielle DiMartino Booth, the CEO and Chief Strategist of Quill Intelligence, and in my opinion, one of the absolute best Fed watchers out there. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Pleasure to be here today. We are recording this just ahead of the very important Fed meeting. And Danielle, um, we all want to know the answer to this question initially. What's the Fed going to do at this meeting? As opposed to what I think um, that the Fed voters, and that, that is what's critical now. It's Esther George has rotated off. She's leaving the Fed. Charlie Evans is, um, he's leaving the Fed as well. But actually, Austin Goolsby, who replaced him in Chicago, um, he's kind of a known dove. He rotates on to uh, voting this year. Neil Kashkari, who's traditionally been very dovish, sounds like the biggest hawk out there. He rotates on to uh, voting. Uh, an irony, if you will, here I am in Dallas, Texas. Lori Logan, um, who came from the New York Fed, she used to run the New York Markets Desk, very prestigious position and powerful uh, position within the institution. Uh, she now is the president of the Dallas Fed. She rotates in, and she's been sounding like one of the few doves. Um, on the committee, Lael Brainerd, she's vice chair of the Federal Open Market Committee. She has advocated for uh, things such as universal basic income, maybe not in those words. And yet, uh, as dovish as we know her leanings to be, the central bank digital currency, et cetera, she has come out ahead of this meeting, ahead of blackout, uh, which begins today, the day that we're recording this, which is absolutely critical. She has come out and said, our job is not yet finished. Patrick Harker of Philadelphia, he's considered to be the most hawkish of the new uh, voters in 2023. He came out and not only said yes to the 25 basis point assumption that we will go with unless Nick, unless Nick Tamaros changes that between now and February the 1st, which is, as my good friend Jim Bianco says, you know, the Fed is 75 percent in terms of voting influence, 75 percent Jay Powell, 24 percent Nick Timoros, 1 percent the rest of them. It may sound hyperbolic, but it really is, is the case. And then, of course, it, it, I, I don't I see it as being more than symbolic that Christopher Waller, uh, who really has Jay Powell's ear, who was the director of research under Jim Bullard, who rotated off after December 2022 at FOMC. But he is on the Federal Reserve Board. He has Jay Powell's ear. He was one of the first to say the Fed had no business uh, conducting quantitative easing on the mortgage-backed security side. He really is the closest proxy that we have out there to Jay Powell, John Williams, vice chair of the Federal Open Market Committee, permanent voter. Um, he is extremely, came from the San Francisco Fed, was, was raised under Janet Yellen, and yet he has been a steady lieutenant sticking by Powell and saying, our job is not done here. But back to Patrick Harker for a second, and then we'll, we'll crawl out of the weeds of individual personalities. Not only did he say 25 basis points on February the 1st, he said that there are more rate hikes to come this year, which, and you know, if I can, if I can put the spoiler out there before we even really get going, what's important is whether or not for the first time since Paul Volcker left office in August of 1987, whether or not the Fed is going to defy market pricing, mm. because that is the implication if they're going to keep hiking interest rates the important part about this, we can talk more about it, is as long as they continue, even with baby steps, 25 basis points at a time, as long as that continues, quantitative tightening rolls on in the background, and, and that's what they talk about the least, 
is what's absolutely the most important, and that is QT. We'll get back to QT in a second because I want your take on the internal discussion within the committee. Listening to the members just ahead of the blackout period, we've had uh, members advocating for a 50 basis points hike. We've had members advocating for a 25 basis points hike. We've at least had one member advocating for a 50 basis point hike. Um, but, but not a voter. But not a voter. But what do you make of the internal discussion right now? Um, do you find them to agree on most of the topics of relevance? So, um, you know, to your point that you made before we started recording, there's never been this much division on the Federal Reserve Board, on the Federal Open Market Committee. And yet there seems to be this concerted effort to prevent any dissent from escaping from the Eccles building. And it's been an extraordinary sight to behold to watch Jay Powell keep his caucus together as one group. He's, he suffered, what, one dissent on the part of Esther George last year. She was advocating to slow the pace. But other than that, given what we know about the true personalities and leanings of the individuals, it's extraordinary that we have not seen more dissent, given how divisive a group they are. I mean, I will be right there in five years' time hopefully on a beach in the Caribbean somewhere. Anyway, in five years' time, I will be anxious to read these transcripts mm. when they are released because they will reveal, I think, more of the truth and honesty that's going on around that table because I would say that at least 50% would advocate for halting quantitative tightening, for halting the rate hikes, for beginning to plan on easing, and yet that's not, that's not what we're going to see this year. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture, and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. The market basically anticipates a cutting cycle to commence in the second half of this year, uh, which means that the Fed will have to pause relatively soon for this to be a feasible scenario, Danielle. Do you see any signs or hints whatsoever in the speeches that we've uh, seen from, um, from members of the board over the past couple of weeks that point you in the direction of this being a feasible scenario in practice? I think that they are prepared to pause. I, I I think that they don't want to do that until after they raise three more times. Um, so I think that they want to have that last quarter uh, point hike come through at the June meeting. And then I think they want to pause and hold rates where they are. In other words, I go back to what's most important here, and that is, are they going to defy markets. A little bit of history, October the 6th, 1979, um, Paul Volcker had been in office for two months to the day. It was the Saturday before the Columbus Day holiday. And he called a press conference at the Eccles building on a Saturday evening and said, we're going to change the way that we conduct monetary policy. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. I mean, the market absolutely collapsed in the days that followed. He didn't come out on the evening news until that Thursday that followed and just let markets interpret the Fed moves as they would, as opposed to doing what the market deemed. That was the last individual that did that. Whether you're talking about, especially Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen, and Powell up to now, if markets price in, say, 75% or more chance of a move, whether it's easing or tightening, the Fed has always gone in that direction. So, Pricing in something that the Fed is going to defy is a, an extraordinary event in the last 40 years of monetary policy history in the United States. If we look at the current yield curve, I've looked at data since 1998 on the overnight index swap curve. So basically the expectation 
for the future Fed funds rate. Um, and the spread inversion between 2023 and 2024 is historical. We've never, ever seen anything like it in time series history. So it is a very well anticipated cutting cycle commencing in the second half of the year. What does that backdrop tell you <laughs> um, ahead of the decision making uh, for the Federal Reserve? Well, I think um, other than reflecting what market participants desire, mm. I think that pricing is also telling you that if easing does not commence, that something is going to happen. Mm. And that is that is market's duty. It, it is to price this in and to, to look back, especially as a percentage of the Fed funds rate, because starting points matter, deltas matter. So even though we were coming from a very low base, we've actually tightened more than Volcker tightened, going up to 21%. On a percent, I, I put a little chart out there for you. It's extraordinary. And yet we haven't had a financial event. We haven't seen credit spreads you know, misbehave. And you know what's missing from the calculus here is that the idea of transitory and this huge policy error uh, on the Fed's part in, in insisting that inflation was going to be transitory, what if they knew that it was not going to be transitory in the space of, of months, but also knew that if they kept zero rates at the interest at, at the zero bound, that they would afford corporations the opportunity to extend the maturities of their debt obligations such that they could withstand a future tightening cycle and the financial event that threatened in 2018, 2019 would not recur. Mm. And that's – Jay Powell, he founded the Industrials Group at the Carlisle. He understands hedge funds, private equity. He understands that there's massive risk in the non-banking sector. But giving companies time to extend out that debt has really benefited – in terms of financial stability throughout the hiking cycle that started last March. If we look at the macro backdrop ahead of uh, this meeting in the Federal Reserve, I find it interesting that uh, most analysts still expect a recession to um, commence during the second half of the year. It goes hand in hand with the pricing of cuts from the Federal Reserve, but yet we still struggle to really get the confirmation that the recession is here. Um, so how close are we to this recession? And uh, what's the general assessment on the economic growth within the Federal Reserve at this current juncture? Well, we're about um, 0.01 trillion shy. Um, and there's, it, I think what people don't understand, if you listen to the president of the National um Bureau of Economic Research, which for half a century has scored recessions in the United States. Um, they emphasize that a technical recession is not a recession as they define it. Um, they also, uh, in August of last year, they pointed to the example of July of 1953, when the unemployment rate was 2.2%. And yet that is when they said recession began even with the unemployment rate as low as it was. By December of 1953, the unemployment rate had risen to 3.6%. But the reason that the president of the MBER pointed out that episode, I think, was a warning of sorts to say, we could say that we're in recession, even though Federal Reserve officials insist that until we get verification from the employment data, we cannot be in recession. The NBER is saying, no, that's not the case historically. Historically, we can call recession before, and it goes back to industrial production, um, real income, net of government transfers, uh, per real personal consumption expenditures, and employment. Those are the four major um, barometers that they test to score recession, the largest of which is private demand, right? The 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 aggregate of consumption in the United States, 70% of U.S. GDP, and business investment. If you look at that one particular line item, it has been at $17.7 on an adjusted basis for five quarters, save the 
uh, the, the 17.78 that is um, currently estimated for the fourth quarter of 2022. We don't have that data in hand. But 17.7, 17.7, 17.7, 17.8 estimates for Q1, current quarter 17.7. I think what people should appreciate is that by the rights of the NBER, they could score the recession as having begun in January 2022. And yet we split hairs trying to say, is it going to be the second or third quarter of 2023? When the numbers, they do not score recessions based on GDP growth. They score recessions based on real levels of output, dollars. And I, there's there's just a fundamental misunderstanding in the economics and investment community about how the NBER operates. Danielle, you've made a tremendous chart on the real private demand. Uh, and you told me before we went on air that this is a must-see chart for the financial community out there. So why, why, why don't you walk us through it and why it is so important? Well, I, I, I kind of just did. And that is that one line that shows the constancy of this $17.7 trillion level. Um, you know, the NBER was very careful to point out, well, we, we can't score the recession after two negative prints in Q1 and Q2 of 2022 because net trade was the big swing factor. And that's just GDP math. By the same token, what would GDP have been in the third quarter without net trade. And so that's one of the other reasons that they've been so quiet. But if you drill it down to that one line, real private demand, you see that the U.S. economy has been in a steady state of stagnation for five quarters. It's a very, very long time with the unemployment rate at a half century low, with announcements coming out of Silicon Valley as if they cannot control their stomachs. It's, every, it's like, oh gosh, you know, my, my competitor just announced 10,000. I must announce 12,000. And people are saying it's a white collar recession. It really doesn't matter. Guess what? I'm hearing from home builders. I'm hearing from the manufacturing sector. I'm seeing business closures across the broad economy that these layoff announcements, and we will get to hear about them in forward guidance because companies tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So they're going to shove all of the bad news into forward guidance in the fourth quarter earnings season. And that is going to be accompanied by layoff announcements that are well beyond Silicon Valley. So my point of that chart is we see this 17.7 trillion before we really see the damage inflicted by lost income, by job losses. Speaking of unemployment, uh, I want to get your take on a puzzle to me um, because we've seen the non-farm payrolls report um, at positive territory throughout 2022 while the so-called household survey points to flatlining employment at best, right? So what's the difference between the two? And do you find that divergence telling for the actual labor market? So at, at the risk of, of rousing awake in daylight hours, the conspiracy theorists on my Twitter feed, um, if you look back historically, the birth-death adjustment utterly fails at inflection points. And that is what we've seen in prior lead-ups to recession. And so you go back, I'm going back to Philadelphia Feds, Patrick Harker, you go back and they try and cobble together what the Bureau of Labor Statistics takes a very long time to do, and that is revise the data. And they said, well, you know, in, in those 12 months, it wasn't actually 1.1 million jobs created, it was 10,000. And you're like, that's got to be a typo. And yet, so the BLS has for years in their defense, I almost never say those words, but they have been saying that the private sector, the economics community and the private sector, they have better tools than we do. We need to update our systems so that we can better track the data. A good friend of mine, Michael Green, he's a friend of Real Visions. He's looked at individual states and the eligi eligibility to apply for unemployment benefits has moved down appreciably in the post-pandemic era. 
Many states have said you have exhausted your ability to apply. Gig workers cannot apply for unemployment benefits. The self-employed. Dailyjobcuts.com, huge plug. They literally track each business closure in America on a day-to-day -day basis. I spoke to the gentleman who founded the site in 2009, and we're at business closure levels that are at the highest level since 2009. But if you work for yourself, if, if Quill Intelligence goes away tomorrow, I'm kidding, employees, we're here, but I'm not going to file an unemployment benefit claim against myself. Mm. It doesn't work that way. And yet we're seeing so much of the fallout among the self-employed. That's not going to manifest in the Department of Labor jobless claims data. So we're seeing something that is so partial in the view and at the very huge risk of sticking my foot in my mouth, if you look at the not seasonally adjusted data, which is a very tricky thing to look at, but understanding that seasonal adjustments go back for years that incorporate the pandemic when the data was all over the place, killing seasonal adjustments, you have to take two factors into hand. I know we're too deep in the weeds here. But Challenger Gray and Christmas told us that the December, October through December hiring season was the most anemic in years. Well, if you don't hire people for seasonal positions, you don't have anybody to fire in January. It's just a matter of math. And that's why if you look at the Department of Labor's Continuing claims, there's a big distinction here, right? You can apply for a claim, that makes you an initial claim, an initial jobless claims, or you can be on unemployment, collecting unemployment benefits. That's a continuing claimant. That number troughed in October, October the 8th, 2022. That number is up 58% from its lows and has steadily risen. Again, not seasonally adjusted data is, is a very tricky thing. And it could get me in trouble. But boy, has it been steady. Mm. So I, I, I've, people have been worried about a recession shock. We're going to go from an inflation shock to a recession shock. Michael Hartnett at, at Bank of America kind of coined these terms. I keep telling people I think we're going to have an unemployment rate shock. Because when it does happen, it's going to feel like something that was like, where did that come from? It's been so low for so long. But again... Layoffs are broadening out to the economy beyond Silicon Valley. I'm playing the devil's advocate now, um, and I want to point your attention to the Jolt's job openings number. Oh, it um, looks elevated as beep, right? Um, at least in a historical context. But is it worthwhile watching that job openings number? And, and if not, why not? So uh, my good friend Philip Dunn is probably the best labor economist I know, and also one of the biggest advocates for uh, statistical agencies in Washington, D.C., takes a lot for her to criticize official data. Me, I can do it overnight in my sleep. But when you see work done in concert between the Dallas Federal Reserve and the St. Louis Fed that comes together and says that if you, using algorithms and words, uh, tease out job openings specifically posted for the purpose of poaching your competitor's best employees. You are not looking to remove somebody from the unemployed ranks. You are looking to poach a competitor's best worker. If you tease out those poaching postings, you see that job openings for the unemployed look like a flat line on an EKG. Now, I point this out because it's Fed data that Powell is purposely ignoring. Rare to do that. If the Dallas Fed and the St. Louis Fed, when I was inside, if they came together as two district banks and came up with research that was that seminal it would be presented to the Federal Open Market Committee. The researchers who put it together would go travel to Washington. And during that two-day meeting, there are all kinds of presentations. That data would have been presented to Powell, who then goes to the podium afterwards and says, jobless claims are north of 10 million. We have a massive amount of tightness in the labor market.
full disregard for Fed staff research papers. Extraordinary. Hmm. How is that for devil's advocate? (laughs) Good enough. Um, And I guess my next, next question is whether the Federal Reserve is any close to admitting to these trends. I mean, if we have a weakening labor market beneath the surface of all of this noise in statisticals, and if we have something close to a recession already in the data of real private demand, why are they still considering hiking rates throughout the spring? So again, I I go back to Paul Volcker and convening the press corps on a Saturday evening in the Eccles building and saying, that's all I've got to say, folks. Monetary policy is going to get a lot tighter and we're going to change the way we execute and have a nice evening. Enjoy your long weekend. Happy Columbus Day. And goes away for four days. That's powerful monetary policy. That is monetary policy that is not governed by a financial market. I coined this idea. Everybody has now adopted it. But months ago, I said, what if Powell's trying to break the back of the Fed put? What if he's trying to wrestle back the power of monetary policy making and put that back in the hands of the Federal Reserve? Now, markets say absolutely not. Because, and this is the richest irony, I think, of the last 18 trading months since the market began anticipating the tightening cycle, since they began to make rumblings about it. And that is every single time the market prices in a pivot, Jay Powell sees a bright green light and he drives through it. It is licensed to keep tightening if his goal is to tighten financial conditions, which is not happened yet. They are tighter. But for God's sake, look at the price to earnings ratio on the S&P. You know, even, even huge bulls, equity bulls still say, you know, if we're going to have an earnings recession, multiples are still too high. Mm. But financial conditions remain. Look at credit spreads. Look at, look at record levels of bond sales to open 2023 as if the Fed was conducting QE. Mm. These are all licenses to tighten. If Jay Powell's goal is not taming inflation, which we know is coming down, a blind person could see this. But if his real goal is to truly tighten financial conditions, his job is nowhere near done. Indeed. Um, I've tweeted a meme after each Federal Reserve meeting over the course of Q3 and Q4 last year. Uh, with Jay Powell saying, I'm going to hike interest rates until you morons stop trading monkey JPEGs, right? And here we are in January 23, and um, we are back um, with a market sentiment uh, that is almost champagne-like compared to uh, December last year, right? So, With, uh, With real estate, private real estate, industrial trust putting up gates. Yeah. And I think... um, I'm going to raise a point that you didn't ask me about. If he succeeds, if he succeeds, and if no no phone call is made to the Bank of England, excuse me, to the Federal Reserve Bank that says all of these structured trades are going to collapse, you must intervene. You know, if that doesn't happen, if the phone call is not placed for the first time in 40 years, you will see pensions mark to market their private holdings and that's why you're seeing gates rise private equity private capital right not the non-banking sector as at the end of 2020 was 220 trillion dollars the bank of international settlements said we have, might have a problem here because the conventional financial system is only 180 trillion that's the regulated side 220 trillion but when was the last time it was marked to market It's never had to be because the Fed has always pivoted within a period of time that you can say, we're not taking the marks yet. Mm. And then they ride back in, capital markets reopen, you refinance the debt, private equity never has to come clean. But if they do have to come clean, it will be a seminal shift. And that's why you're seeing gates go up because 
Nobody wants to transact except maybe the Chinese who happen to need money when it comes to commercial real estate. But it is a massive sector. It is a global phenomenon. And as long as nobody sells a building and as long as there's no comparable out there and you're in the world of private capital, you sit and pray. And Jay Powell's got his voicemail on. I ran out the door of Europe's biggest real estate private equity fund just six months ago. So um, I perfectly share your sentiment, Danielle. Uh, and I'm happy to be on the other side of, uh, of that trade now. Ahead of um, the Fed meeting, um, we always discuss whether the Federal Reserve is willing to at all comment on the market pricing six to nine months ahead, right? I remember the discussions on Twitter and elsewhere just after the latest set of meeting minutes. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why don't they comment directly on the inversion of the curve? Why don't they not at the market pricing or um, tell the market that it needs to reprice. So Jay Powell will obviously get questions on this again uh, in coming months. Is it possible for the Fed to comment on the market pricing, say a year or two ahead, or will they just stick to the short-term view of hiking interest rates? So before he became a one-man dot plot several press conferences ago when he lost his cool, before that, Philosophically, he had no confidence in the dot plot. And he's always maintained that there's only so much you can see over the horizon and that ergo the Fed is data dependent. I don't see any benefit to Jay Powell to change that narrative at all when he's at the podium. It doesn't do him any good. If again, his goals are what I think his goals are. Mm. And he, he's, he has actually nodded to the yield curve inversion, especially after the three-month tenure mm. inverted, which is their official. Um, but nodding to it, acknowledging it, and then changing the way you make monetary policy, they're two different things. Remember, go back to real private demand. If we're in recession, the yield curve should be steepening like mad. Mm. And yet, we're not there. Nope. So if we assume that the Fed will stick to its guns, communicate that they intend to bring interest rates higher, at least for the next couple of meetings, what do we make of it as investors, Danielle? Um, would you worry ahead of the early summer if the Fed is not willing to nod to the market inversion or to the yield curve inversion uh, outside of just saying that we've acknowledged it, but we're going to hike interest rates still? So before Speaker McCarthy's 15th vote, um, I would have said worry. Mm. After his 15th vote, I would say that mechanistically, uh, Janet Yellen running down the U.S. government's checking account at the Federal Reserve, the Treasury General account, the TGA, because she's now forced into that mode, the Fed has the grace of time. The bite of liquidity depletion that would have been quantitative tightening will effectively be neutralized by Janet Yellen pumping money into the system that normally would have to be a maintained minimal balance mm. in the Treasury general account. How ironic is it, especially if they flip a switch, there's a deal made on the debt ceiling, and the Treasury rushes into the market, which by law it has to, and sells a bunch of bills. And then you get the effect of QT and the bill sales at once. Imagine markets reaction. Yeah, but potentially a, um, a question for the second half of the year, at least late Q2, if the current crossover projections are, are correct. Uh, as far as I 
um, here, the U.S. Treasury, they expect the actual crossover date to be sometime in June, right? June. Yeah. So we have a few months left on, until that actual date. But I want to speak about the mechanics behind this liquidity addition from the Treasury General Account. I think it's a really interesting topic um, and not something that you see covered in mainstream media, uh, to say the least. I need Danielle, to get out more. Yeah, <laughs> you do. <laughs> Dan- Danielle, um, as far as I remember, um, the Treasury is simply forced to empty the Treasury General account ahead of the crossover date. Um, and will it go all the way to zero or is there like an amount of billion that they will aim for on this Treasury General account currently stuck at, say, 350 billion thereabout? So we came so close. We came so very close to crossing that Rubicon. Um, and then a deal was sealed. Um, Emergency measure, emergency measures dictate that as Yellen, who could not, you could not have a worse person in the position right now, but as the balance is depleted, you have to begin to make some very difficult choices. Okay, there goes the Smithsonian in the middle of summer. We're going to close down the National Museum system. There goes the park Mm. system. Yellowstone's closing. Um, there are decisions that can be made. There, are, there are no, there's non-essential spending cuts that can be made that stop the bleed on that balance. And those decisions are extremely difficult and they're politically toxic. It will be very, very, very difficult to push these through. And yet, if the lying representative from New York is booted, McCarthy's got all of a four person majority and they're in it to win it. They want to make a point. They want to make a 2011 point of this debt ceiling. Credit rating agencies have already come out and assured we're not even considering, we're not thinking about thinking about downgrading the sovereign debt of the United States. We can assure you that this is not going to be a repeat of 2011. Try telling that to the people who forced the 15 votes because they've, they want their pound of flesh. They want to make a point. So it's going to be extreme. A lot of these extremely difficult decisions, I think, are going to have to be made to not deplete that checking account balance of the country. If we look at the current level of the Treasury general account, um, a little bit more than 300 billion on the account right now. Um, and if we assume that it moves towards zero, commercial banks will be on the receiving end of that liquidity, uh, commercial markets. Uh, so this is a positive impulse for financial markets. It's positive from, liquidity. Yes. Um, from a very, uh, technical, uh, angle, basically. Will this allow the Federal Reserve to run the quantitative tightening program for longer than otherwise? That's a big question. That is my point. Mm. You put it succinctly, you put it better than I did, but that's the same as, 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 as the stock market rallying 10%. It's that same spirit of a license. Running down the TGA allows the Fed, call it $60 billion a month, right? They're doing nothing on mortgage-backed securities, which actually might pick up with mortgage rates falling. But prepays, you're still, there's a gulf between 2.5% and 6 Let's get real. But let's call it $60 billion a month, treasuries. That's still quantitative tightening, and it's still very real. And my mentor, Lacey Hunt, you know, he has me tracking every single week other deposits at commercial banks on the liability side. And that has been declining since March. We saw M2 growth in a data series back to 1959 as of November hit zero. Never seen that. Never seen it. So there is a quiet reaction in monetary aggregates. Banks are as you say, going to be on the receiving end of this liquidity, and yet lending standards are being clamped. You left CRE six months ago. You really think they're making new CRE loans, even though they can? So lending standards are really being clamped down. Wells Fargo has just told us, we're really going to step back from that thing called mortgages. So auto loans are blowing up. 
credit card lines have been drawn. So, and companies have drawn their lines of, of credit as well. I, it, it comes down to a similar situation of why, when the Fed was printing money for a decade, could they not hit their 2% inflation target? Well, you can't force the banks to lend, even if the liquidity is there, especially when you can get 5% on cash, 5% on cash. Total personal advertisement for children. I thought, because they all wanted to buy meme stocks. I'm like, no, no, no. What about Dogecoin, mom? No, no, no. But this is going to be fun. On February the 1st, all four of my children's savings are going to go into a 5% compounding interest account. They're going to get to learn what compound interest is. It's a lot easier to make money. And I think... I think you have to bear in mind the demographics of retirees right now. They can choose to not be in junk bonds for the first time in their adult lives. They can choose to go buy a CD at a bank for a year. There's optionality in the risk-free world that retirees and savers haven't had for a generation. And I think that's ultimately good news um, if we get on the other side of this potential turbulence. But instead of phrasing it as higher for longer, the right phrase might be tighter for longer for the Federal Reserve, right? To ensure that we both remember the quantitative tightening running for longer as a consequence of the debt ceiling and the interest rate hikes that are still ahead of us throughout the spring. So I guess... I mean, word on, word on the street was that at Jackson Hole, you know, his eight minute, 28 second speech, you know, the, the punctuation point was, you know, no loosening of monetary policy for all of 2024, pass it on. And that was the word coming out of Jackson Hole, was stick to the narrative that even if we pause, we're not loosening policy. And as long as they don't, as long as they say we're paused, we're going to stop here at this terminal rate, but we're not loosening, that's code word for saying QT will continue. Mm. And... I also want you out there to remember, as soon as we get at that deal, we will see renewed issuance and QT at the same time. So when we get at that deal, you better run for the hills. <laughs> it's a double barrel effect. Yeah. Mm. So I guess that sums up the discussion on the Federal Reserve very nicely. We have interest rate hikes ahead of us still, even though there is a division in the um, in the FOMC, it's not really something that you should um, spend too much time on, given that Jay Powell is the dot plot. Um, and finally, watch the um, all of the negotiations surrounding the debt ceiling because it matters a whole lot for the Fed output as well. And it also matters that we're not going to see a stimulus check, even if the National Bureau of Economic Research comes out publicly and says the United States economy is in recession. By the same token that they're going to negotiate so hard on the debt ceiling, this House of Representatives is not going to vote into law some massive stimulus check, post-pandemic style, to get sent out to people. And, you know, there's one other chart that I sent you that is so, so critical, if you don't mind, if we have a few mm, seconds. Absolutely. Um, when I was when I was researching... Um, private income net of government transfers, a tax refund is not considered to be a government transfer. This is money that you paid the government that you shouldn't have. They're not writing you a stimulus check. It's not a government transfer. It's not, it's not a food stamp payment. It's not, it's not any kind of, 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 of a welfare benefit, if you will. But in the verbiage of the 2021 stimulus that Biden signed into law shortly after he got into office, there was this loophole that said, if at any time in the first three quarters of 2021, you can, um, you can exhibit that your company was disrupted in any way, shape or form by COVID, you can claw back up to $26,000 in payroll taxes per employee. $164 billion in the 12 months through December, 2022 was sent out in the form of business income tax refunds. And the greatest evidence that you had of that was all the children that you saw sitting in business class seats. And Wall Street's narrative that there was going to be this lovely 
just just seamless baton handoff from good spending to services spending, well, that manifested because that $164 billion went to buy some really nice vacations. Mm. It was one of the wealthiest, it was, it was one of the biggest wealth transfers to the wealthy, signed into law by a Democrat. But nobody talks about the massive amount of money that's been injected into the economy. Listen to Bloomberg Radio, getrefunds.com. You can claim this through 2025. And there's a cottage industry that has risen up out of the ashes to help companies make their claims. And U.S. taxpayer dollars. I, your, your accent tells me you're not paying for this, but I am. <laughs> Thankfully not. Um, and as far as I remember, Danielle, the tax refund season commences in the first week of February, right? It does. And you bring up a separate issue as I'm speaking about business income tax refunds. Yeah. And that's why it went to the wealthy, if you will, the yes. top 10%, people who own businesses and have employees. The IRS has already come out and warned individuals. There were no stimulus checks in 2022. There were no federal unemployment benefits in 2022. There were no child tax credits paid in cash. And therefore, you, individual income tax filer, need to be prepared for your income tax refund to be much smaller, or you might even have to write a check. American households do, they have not received this memo. They plan to get the same amount of money or more when they file their taxes and they're in for a very rude awakening because they have their holiday credit card bills waiting to get paid as they do every year. They have their eye on that that new car lot that's finally got inventory because that's their down payment for their car. That's not coming. And nobody talks about this. Nobody. So if we get a smaller refund season relative to normal, it may take longer to empty the treasury general account, right? Yes. 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 That was brilliant. Which, which, which allows the QG program to run for even longer. <laughs> Perfect. There you, you, you really connect those dots. Thank you. Perfect conclusion um, to this show on the Federal Reserve. Um, we should expect more hikes. We should expect the QG program to run at least until summer, as far as I can hear. Danielle de Diamantino Booth, um, the Chief Strategist and CEO of Quill Intelligence, a great pleasure to host you. And thank you for joining Real Vision. Thank you for having me. What an interview with... Danielle Di Martino Booth. Uh, she's extremely knowledgeable around the Fed reaction function and extremely knowledgeable around all of the economic data filtering into the model setup of the Federal Reserve. And I have a few important takeaways from the discussion with Danielle. First of all, you should expect the dollar liquidity situation to be an ongoing issue for the Federal Reserve from now and until late this autumn. As a consequence of the debt ceiling dragging out the discussion on the quantitative tightening program, and as the debt ceiling will ultimately end up adding liquidity to dollar markets, it will ultimately also postpone the final date of QT. And that is of relevance to the market outlook when we look three, six months ahead as dollar liquidity is a clear driver of right about every asset class. Secondly, the Fed may seem a bit divided on whether to deliver a quarter of a percentage point in interest rate hikes or a 50 basis point interest rate hike. But by the end of the day, Danielle's take is that Jerome Powell is a one-man dot plot by now. So you shouldn't listen to all of the noise from the members of the committee since Jay Powell is behind the wheel. And Jay Powell is still very clear in his communication. Do not take excessive risk. Otherwise, the Fed will continue to hike to bring down risk taking and to ensure that financial conditions remain tight until inflation is closer to target than what is currently the case. And um, if we look at the economic performance into this meeting, 
I think Danielle is of the contrarian view that the U.S. economy may already be in a recession. Uh, that is far from consensus right now, but she points to the fact that real private demand is already flatlining. And that is of relevance when the Statistical Bureau will decide whether we are in a recession or not, probably in a year from now. We will ultimately only know whether it was a recession once the dust settles. And at that time, it will be too late to make decisions based on the recession call from the Statistical Bureau. So for now, the message is crystal clear from both Daniel DiMartino Booth and likely also Jay Powell. Do not take excess risk. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.